that you become as little children, uh, as Jesus taught 2,000 years ago. Except you become as little children, uh, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. There are many people that have interpreted that teaching from the Bible, but Jesus does clarify that in the Course of Miracles. He says, what he meant by that was that little children, infants, are completely dependent on their parents for everything. Likewise, be that dependent on the Holy Spirit for everything. You can't become too dependent on the Holy Spirit. If people think that dependency is an addiction, well there's one good addiction, and that's being addicted to the Holy Spirit. You cannot become too addicted to the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit is a remembrance of who you are. And all the Holy Spirit teaches you, every single instruction in your mind, is given from love and to awakening to love. And there's a beautiful line in the Course that says, You cannot wake yourself, but you can allow yourself to be awakened. I love that. That really hits it right in the core. You cannot wake yourself, but you can allow yourself to be awakened. So if we're getting into the second part today of Awakening to Love's Presence, or the title of the book is Awakening Through A Course of Miracles, there's such a humbleness, there's such a true humility to allowing yourself to be awakened. One of the words that comes out of Armel's mouth so much is allow. Allow, hello, she calls, hello, hello. <laughs> Do I say that? Hello. Yeah. <laughs> I'm giving the actual, the translation for everyone, the English translation of that is allow, hello, hello. Before I was doing the French translation for him, now he does That's the, right. the English one for me. <laughs> I, I, I help out with the English translations. But, but that is such an important um, word and presence, because we all know what it means. You know, there's something in our core of our being, we know that allowance has to do with permission. Some of us have grown up in a life where there was a lot of rules and structure. Uh, some of us have grown up in families in, in which there wasn't, wasn't a lot of, of affection. We kind of grew up in sterile homes where sometimes things were talked about, but you know how they say actions speak louder than words. We heard the love word, but sometimes we looked at our parents and we didn't see them expressing affection to each other, and, and we didn't feel affection ourselves. Um, sometimes we grew up in homes where it was reflected from our mind that there, as I said, there was lots of rules. You, you couldn't break the rules, you know, like children are to be seen, not, uh, not heard. That, that, you know, we were to be kind of invisible. And we were second class citizens, and so we had to just follow the rules of the house. Or, it, it's my way or the highway, we had to leave the house or follow the rules. That was not uncommon. And, and some of us grew up in households where we were never allowed to express feelings. Ever. If you started expressing emotions and feelings, oftentimes it wasn't, we didn't have it written on the wall, do not express feelings, but it was just a look that you would get from your mother or your dad when you'd ex start expressing an intense emotion. Kind of like a look like, this is not appropriate, or stuff it, or zip it, as the <laughs> Austin Powers would say, zip it. Or it makes me feel so bad. Or, or, yes. Yes, or, or even, even better, my mother, she was really funny because when I was a little girl, I always talked. So they would try to avoid speaking things to me that they didn't want anybody else knowing because I was already practicing no private thought when I was a little girl. So we would go, yeah, we would go somewhere and I would start sharing everything I heard and I would receive kick under the table. <laughs> 
now. <laughs> yeah. And the thing, I think the thing about no feelings, no expression of feelings, that what I've discovered is that is, is very much an inhibition on your spiritual journey to awakening to love's presence. If you aren't in touch with your feelings and not expressing them, you don't, it doesn't leave you with a lot of options except stuff it. Stuff it down, repress it. And I know that was my childhood, seemingly in this world, it was reflected as I, I became an introvert, I was very shy, uh, I was very contemplative, but I was not in touch with my emotions. And for a lot of men in particular, it's the John Wayne stereotype, the strong silent type. You're not supposed to cry, you don't express emotions, and they didn't tell us that this would inhibit our spiritual growth and development. And years later, as I would, in the mid-2000s, I would go down to South America, macho, macho man, you know, the, the macho stereotype, very strong in, in South America, Latin America. I would go to groups and I would do enlightenment gatherings where I always invite everybody to my gatherings. I never do men's groups or women's groups. I just, I think that's ridiculous. Uh, spiritually, so I just invite everyone to come to self-realization awakening groups. But in Argentina, it was like when I did that, and I went all over Buenos Aires and Mar del Plata, and Miramar. I mean, I went quite around the east coast of uh, Argentina. There, I spoke to many, many, many groups, and I'd say on the average, it was probably like 97 percent women at my enlightenment gatherings. I invited everybody and 97% women came and 3% men. When I got up to Colombia, Venezuela, I think it was more like 95%. A little bit more, a few more men came, not many. But that, when I prayed to the Spirit and I asked him, Jesus said, well yeah, it's not, it's not a male-female thing at all. It's just this thing around emotions. It's a stereotype thing when you grow up in, with a concept where you're supposed to stuff your emotions down and not be in touch with your emotions, you're inhibiting your growth spiritually because the emotional realm is still on the outer rings of those rings I talked about last night. It's very close to the perceptual realm. It's right under the perceptual realm, but it's right before thoughts and belief and desire. And the only way you get down into thoughts and belief and desire is to be in touch with your emotions. You need to use your emotions as like a barometer of when you need to go inward, find out what's inside, what's underneath those emotions, instead of just staying locked up there in perception and emotion, really on the surface of things. And a lot of the women I met down in South America too, they were desperate for partners that they could relate to and share the deepest things in their heart with. They. They, they did ask me, are there men on the planet that actually are going through the spiritual awakening process and, and I want their names, addresses, and phone numbers. <laughs> I could have made millions of pesos if I had a dating Holy service. Spirit, matchmaker. matchmaker, David's matchmaker, metaphysical matchmaker <laughs> service. Multi-millionaire in South America. But actually, I would talk with them and I would say, please, just see how important this is. So the men that did come, I, I spoke in quantum, I spoke in their scientific terms, and they lit up as well. But but they knew that they had a lot of work to do. I see a hand go up back yeah, there. I was wondering, do you think if you did, um, do we step? Yeah. Do you think that if you separated and did men's groups and women's groups down there, that more men would have come because maybe they would have felt safe because there weren't weren't women there that they could show that, express themselves more, or open up more? I think that's why there are, in the United States in particular, that's why they often have men's groups, because there is more of a feeling of safety. Although I was expressing these deep ideas of enlightenment, it was so deep um, that my thing has never been to try to reach people, because I see it's all for my mind. I teach what I would learn and I let it rip through at the deepest level. If I'm, I've been with a lot of men in the sense that I, when I travel, 
I, I travel trains, planes, buses, cars, walking. So I have had huge numbers of interactions with men. But it's all just given from the Spirit. So um, I never have been guided to do that, but I do realize that, that there is something about a comfort when people feel safe with that. And at our monastery, um, it was about a couple years ago, they had a women's retreat and, and then Jason took the men down to the campground and they had a men's retreat and there was a lot of opening of the hearts and um, it, it worked out beautiful that way. And it was beautiful because the women were, had the boombox going and they were all in their bikinis and bathing suits and letting go of all their thoughts about their body image and everything. My three-legged cat, just the look on her face, you know, she was just, she'd never seen such a parade <laughs> in her life, but it was very healing, yeah. actually. Yeah. yeah, it was just allowing a lot of jealousy thought or comparison, competition, just a lot of things that I think at some point we all go through and we need to face and really look at what it is and not stuff it down or not do as, oh no, I never have those feelings and being very proud. It's like we really need to just open it up and really look at what's truly going on and be honest because that's the way for it to just be healed and really to be released and uh, it's really important. So some of you might be familiar with like attitudinal healing, for example, Jerry Jampolsky, Diane Simoncioni, they have a process for opening up. Um, some of you might have heard of Byron Katie and her, her work. Um, we've kind of crisscrossed around the world as she's doing her process and I've been sharing my process. Um, there's, a, there's a man named Michael Rice who originally was out of Missouri and Florida. He did a 12-step uh, worksheet, forgiveness worksheet, and the Spirit gave me this one. It was actually 12 steps and it was called Instrument for Peace, that people all over the world use right now. Also, we have seen the value of getting in touch with emotions, so we have spiritual communities in, in Spain, and Canada, and the United States, in Hawaii, and we've had them in Australia, and soon to be Mexico, and they also, also are springing up in China now and other places uh, that use what we call clarity process or expression sessions. And uh, Sundari has had expression session groups in her home here uh, in Lafayette, near Berkeley. And so they're springing up around the world and it's really, they're based on this idea that you have to get in touch with your emotions. And you have to have an allowance, there's that word again, hello, you have to allow the emotions. Wait, wait, listen, allowance. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Allowance. You have to allow them up. Allow. <laughs> and, and it's so beautiful when, when you do because we've seen that it accelerates the healing. It really does accelerate the healing. So this today can actually be uh, an expression session for all of us. And then I think we can do it, I think some diet work, which is also very helpful and very safe. Little diet, little one-on-one, some. -on -one, um, letting those emotions up. And maybe you want to just share, I mean Armel is very, very in touch with her emotions and has been her whole life. So it's been very natural for her and in that sense she's kind of like a leader. I've always said she thought it was a curse uh, that her emotions were always on her sleeve and she was wearing her heart on her sleeve. I said, no, no, that's not a curse at all. That's actually a blessing because it's giving a demonstration for the rest of humanity that it's intense but it's safe. Uh, it's, a, it's a fast track to knowing yourself as you were created by God. And, and so, yeah, I mean I know you would say that it has enormous benefit. I mean it's been very intense and at times it feels so intense like you just want out or they want, want to escape, but, but you've hung in there with, with that and it's made all the difference. Yeah, the thing that is coming to my mind is um, that the Spirit knows us so well that He will always give us everything we need, even if we don't know it. And for me, the beginning of this path, after two months that I joined the community, I've been offered a husband. 
and <laughs> so I got, a, I got a guidance to get married and Eric was very intellectual and absolutely not in touch with his emotion but he knew the course on his on his fingertips and I didn't I just I just started it in April we got married in October I met David in June and my whole life totally shifted and the only thing that I, that I knew about the course was the prayer that I talked about yesterday. I'm here only to be truly helpful. And that's the thing that I would practice all the time. And, and just giving over my thoughts to the Spirit and forgive. That, that's all. And from time to time I would read or I would do some lesson. So being with Eric was very helpful because it, I was very in touch with, with my emotion. But I, I was very reactive to everything actually because I was so hypersensitive. And him being so intellectual and knowing the course was kind of a good uh, complementary ego dynamic and the spirit is all, often pairing up like that to just really help me to, um, how do you say, it? you know what I mean? Uh, to, to just really have a process in my mind when an emotion would come that I could look at it differently than just crying for hours and just because I would stay for hours really with this emotion or days, I would just feel it and I would not be able to come out of it because it was so strong for me. So it felt really helpful to have the other part where I, I would start to open up to look at it differently. And, and it's true, uh, whatever's arising, I just can't hold it back. I, I don't even, I can't even know. You know, I can't even give a process for that. It's just how it is for me. But I do feel it's it's the most helpful thing ever because uh, it doesn't stay really with the understanding of what the course is teaching and the allowance. Is it? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. And the allowance. <laughs> I'll say it again. Uh, of following those emotions to come. Um, it's just such a fast track. And, you know, the Course is talking about that the gentle way is not necessarily the, the slowest one. We have to allow the Spirit, allow the Spirit to, um, to, to, give, to give us the curriculum, to give us the pace at which we are ready to go, and to really allow everything to be exactly as it is. So, what I feel tremendously helpful is that whenever something is coming up, I would just let it up and I would cry wherever I am. I can be in the restaurant like three days ago, like and there's this overwhelming love that is there. And it's just that, uh, okay, tears are rolling down my cheek and that's how it is. And, and why would you try to hide that? This is the most beautiful thing ever, really. Allowing yourself to be exactly as you are because I remember at the beginning of, of this path, I was doing a lot of um, uh, radio, um, SEIM, SEIM radio something. SEIM Gather? Yeah, SEIM Gather. I would talk every week there, and I always had an idea in mind that I wanted to be like David, or I wanted to be like the messengers. And what I kept hearing, it was such a pressure, actually, to try to be someone else, or something else, or some try to become try to become, which is really coming from this belief that I'm not enough as I am, I'm not perfect as I am. And, and the Spirit would constantly tell me, I just want you to be you. I just want to use you exactly the way you are. You don't have to change anything at all. And it was part of that, part of this openness of sharing all my thoughts, sharing all the process that I was going through, sharing all the darkness that I was going through, because truly the intensity of the darkness that is down there is like, whoa, this is amazing. I had intense rage coming up. I had no idea it was there. I didn't think I was angry or uh, it would happen from time to time, but right after my marriage, like the ego just wow rushed in in such a strong way because the purpose of us being together was awakening to our true self. So for sure, the ego had no chance there if we were just really practicing every moment, seeing the other as innocent and practicing forgiveness all the time. And the first six months were so intense, all the unworthiness came up. I had no idea it was there. I had a thought that I was a beautiful, popular girl. I didn't know I wasn't, I wasn't worthy. I didn't know I had the thought that I wasn't confident or I hated myself. I had no idea that all that was there, but here it was. And it was really asking to be seen. 
and not keeping pushing it away and keeping just hiding behind mask and behind self-concept and behind um, trying to get a better job or having a nice car or having a lot of money, but just really allowing everything. If I recall, uh, your husband used the fat word, said you're fat. Right. And apparently, I guess that's not, you're not supposed to say that to wives. Uh, I guess I read in magazines that these are the, the ten don'ts <laughs> if you want your marriage to last. And, but, but the Holy Spirit had the relationship in order to flush up and heal everything. So, how did that go when, when yeah. Eric said, you're fat? It was how, really how long were you married when you actually heard the you're fat statement? Three weeks. Three weeks. Oh my, that, that'll put an end to the honeymoon. Uh, spirit in a hurry. Oh yeah. Oh yes. I was ready to go. Yeah, I just, I just couldn't, I couldn't reconcile that he could love me if he was telling me I'm fat because the whole identity was about having the perfect body in order to be loved, being the most beautiful in order to be loved. Everything was about that and that was such a strong self-concept for me. It felt like my whole life had been about that, like since since I, as, as long as I could have remember that. And when he say that, I, it was irreconcilable for me. I, and he, he could tell me, but I love you. It's like, no, like stop lying to me. This is not possible. I cannot believe that you would not, you would tell me I'm fat, which in my mind was interpreted, I'm absolutely not attracted by you. And, and also in the same time telling me that he was attracted by two other women. <laughs> It's like it was the whole context. It's, we were really practicing no private thoughts. So I'm fat and I'm attracted by two other women. Okay, great. Three weeks marriage. Okay. <laughs> How long is it going to last? <laughs> but that was the whole purpose. And it was really the purpose for me to come in touch with really with all those beliefs about how the body was so important in my life and how I thought that love was related to how the body was and related to love was related to someone external to me loving me or accepting me as I am. But I could see I wasn't accepting myself as I was. I hated myself. And that's what I came in touch with, with him sharing that. I really came in touch with this deep hatred. And it was so intense that I couldn't, I just couldn't stay with that. I would just constantly want to kill others. I would, I would have all this rage. It was so intense. We were in a, yeah, I just want to give you the context of that. We were in a month long retreat with David during that time. <laughs> So we were really surrounded by love and just and every day we would have teaching session with the whole group. We were living at, it was an experience where we were living at 13, two properties and having a deep devotional time all together. And so it was really intense because the purpose was so strong. We were 30 people living there with the same intent to clear the mind, to wash away all the false thought, to let all the emotions up. And I can tell you, oh my God, I had the feeling that I was expressing everything for the whole group. And I often had that in my life, like the feeling that, why are those people not expressing anything? I feel like it's all coming through me. Why am I the one, the only one? That's always that. Why am I the only one to feel the way I feel? Why not? Is, isn't there anybody else feeling that way or having those kind of emotion? And that's where I would think that it was a curse. Yeah, because I, I would think that, I was different. There was also an interesting other thing because they had get married and were doing this thing with 30 people living together on two big villas over on the island of Mallorca off the coast of Spain. And I'm doing metaphysical movies every night and we're really flushing up the ego. It's the Roto-Rooter approach. Like, let's, let's get down there and we're not afraid of the big bad wolf. Just get the Roto-Rooter down there and you know, just get it up. And it, interestingly enough, when Armel was going through all this self-hatred and the rage and everything was coming up, uh, the Holy Spirit decided to use her, her brand new husband in a, a musical collaboration for hours a day with Hello. Helena. Because uh, Helena had a lot of spirit pouring through her and they would come together and have these huge co music collaborations that would go on for hours and hours. And then Eric would come out and, and tell his new bride, <laughs> It's been fantastic. Helena and I are having these amazing collaborations. And you're fat. <laughs> and, and it would just really 
you know, they were sharing, they were practicing the, the pr no private thoughts, no people pleasing, just really very well, you were really practicing, but, but I, it's so great that you're sharing because the unconscious darkness and unworthiness and hatred, as long as that's buried down there, it, it runs your life. It may be that you have a smooth sailing life, but you end up developing seemingly cancer or, or it can, comes out in like psychosomatic ways, or it can come out where there's just a lot of anger and bitterness, but it's beautiful that you know, that you were so diligent in actually coming to really do this for forgiveness. Yeah, and really realizing that however it would come out, I would just, all, I would constantly go away. I would constantly go for a walk, like, okay, this is not about anybody else. I need to get my mind straight here. And that's what, how I would process with it. I would just walk and walk and walk. And every day or every two days, I would just, okay, I'm leaving. And I would go, and after 100 meters, I would, you know, you're not leaving. Where are you going? And so I would sit by myself on a, a beautiful uh, brick wall like uh, they have in Spain, and I would just sit and I would pray. And, okay, Holy Spirit, you need to help me. I cannot do that. I cannot do that. And that's really what it is about. Is uh, I'm I'm overseeing the center there in Hawaii, and I keep telling them like, pray first, pray first, because you have all the answers inside you, and you don't need to rush necessarily to always speak to someone or always having someone that you know you can you know just throw it out all day and uh, it's just really that we need to learn to pray and to ask for the answers because they are there and that's what i would do i would just go out and sometimes it was so intense i would need to speak some to someone because it's like i couldn't find the, the sanity in my in my mind in my own mind and i was unable to listen to the spirit but the funny thing is I always heard him. <laughs> I was just so unwilling to listen <laughs> to, and to really, to really go with whatever he was telling me because, uh, because it would just shake my whole world apart. I had such a strong identity actually that I wasn't aware of, but to be a victim of others. And Eric would constantly, when I was going through a lot of stuff, he would tell me, you still trying to use this relationship to be a victim? I was like, oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> and really just constantly remind me, the attacker is not outside of yourself. It's in you, Armel, and you have to face it. You're not going to have my support in order to be a victim. And that's what this relationship was about. And that's what relationship in our community is all, are, is all about. It's all about mirroring the truth. And whatever you try to play out, it's never going to work because we all have one desire to be aligned with spirit and to be in true empathy, first with ourselves. But that's how we teach it in others to strengthen, strengthen that in ourselves. And so... I was like, no way you're going to keep playing out what you played your whole life. It's not going to work. And so it was beautiful, actually, because I had to be honest with myself. I had to be honest that I was hearing the Spirit. I didn't want to listen to the Spirit. I didn't want to follow Him. And I was scared of letting go of all those identities that I had been holding on to my whole life. And I feel it's so important to, to really just be aware of it, to really be that honest with ourselves as we walk this path and really allow it to come into surface so that it can be released. Yeah. So that's just like an example, that's a demonstration. We have to put these principles into practice. A lot of times I'll say that spiritual awakening is 1% principle and 99% practice. And so that's all of our communities emphasize practice. Um, there are a lot of teachers of A Course in Miracles. Some of them will actually emphasize the Holy Spirit. Some emphasize more of the teachings and the metaphysics and emphasize how difficult it is to hear the Holy Spirit. Uh, for me, I don't emphasize that because that has not been my experience. Uh, I started off early on with the Course, like I said, re reading it for like eight hours a day for the first two, two and a half years, not consecutively, uh, just when I didn't have my eyelids uh, dragging down with resistance. Um, I had to say, face the same resistances that everyone does. I had a pretty open, ready mind though to be able to read it for eight hours a day. And then quickly after those first um, few years, 
started to go to like five course groups uh, a week in Cincinnati, Ohio, and then it just kind of exploded after that as far as traveling, speaking, meeting course students all over the world. But it was still the practice. All I kept hearing, I remember one year in particular, it was like the Holy Spirit and Jesus were like a broken record. Uh, it was, they were always telling me, it's your lesson. And I would be, but, 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 but. it's your lesson, it's your lesson, it's your lesson, it's your lesson, it's your lesson. It just was kind of bringing it home. But, but, they know it's your lesson, it's your lesson. It's bringing it back to mind. The healing has to occur in the mind. It's not a, an equation where they do their part and you do your part. No, it's you in mind do the work, the inner work of forgiveness, like Byron Katie emphasizes, <coughs> turning it around, turning it around, turning it around, over and over and over, and doing it persistently. In fact, on Facebook, I think yesterday I just saw somebody put a quote up, and they said the reason that it showed a canyon, a deep canyon, like, this, like uh, the Grand Canyon or some sharp canyon with water, with a stream pouring through it. And it was saying, the strength does not come in the force of the water, but the persistence of the water. Those rocks have been there a long time, and, and they're hard, but, but the water just keeps coming and coming and coming, and it carves through the rock. Uh, the other thing is like the ocean, you know, you see the sand is so soft and pliant, but it's just the waves, the persistent waves, coming and coming and coming. I love that feeling of the persistence of the waves. It's, that's like God calling us home. The waves just keep coming and coming and coming. And no matter how hard the rocks are around our heart, they turn into soft, gooey sand. You can put your, your toes into after a while. They're not, it's not hard at all because the water has softened it and turned it into this very soft, comfortable sand. And that's like breaking down the walls in our heart, the egoic walls. It's beautiful how that works.